Welcome to Menopause Reimagined. I'm your host, Andrea Donsky, and I'm a nutritionist for more than 16 years who's in menopause. I'm a menopause educator and avid menopause researcher. The purpose of this show is to educate and empower you as you enter into perimenopause and menopause and beyond, so that you can take control of your symptoms and your health. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Lori Batito. She's a clinical psychologist with a specialty in sexual wellness, and she's been, she's been a practicing psychotherapist for over 30 years. For the last three decades, Lori has been doing radio and television, sharing sex and relationship advice. Dr. Lori is the author of The Sex Bible for People Over 50, and she's done two TED Talks on the subjects of sexuality. Now, here's Dr. Lori. Welcome to the show, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to have you because I want you to share what inspired you to become a clinical psychologist talking about sex. So I've been doing this a long time and from the beginning of my career talking about sexuality. So I, I've always wanted to be in the helping profession. I started off as a social worker and then went on to do a doctorate in uh, in psychology and did a lot of training uh, in my earlier years as a sex therapist and just was really fascinated by human sexuality. I had an ease about talking about it, did research in that field, and then got the opportunity to talk to audiences and to kind of disseminate information. So for over 30 years, I was also right from the beginning, beginning of my career doing radio. So I had a, a radio program talking about sex, answering people's questions. Um, for 10 years, it was like a once a week thing. And then it became for, for 22 years, I had a nightly show show uh, in Montreal um, on the airwaves, which was, you know, I did over 5,000 episodes, each and every one talking about sexuality and relationships. And uh, so to me, if I look at what my raison d'etre is, like it really is to educate the public like you do in, in so many other ways. Right. But to me, that's what it was. It was providing uh, evidence-based, science-based information to people and opening up the conversation. So I never shied away from any topics related to sexuality because we need to talk about it. Even if I talked about, I don't know, a fetish, you might not engage in it. I might not engage in it, but somebody out there does. And why? And this allows us to understand how other people live their sexuality and will uh, it will make us less judgmental in the end when we have a better understanding because we tend to judge that which we do not understand uh so to me that was really important so i did radio and television and print and um now now a podcast and and so my whole life has been around talking to people about uh sexual wellness my book came about um, when I was turning 50. Mm. So when I was looking around and all my friends were 50 and I was 50 and and then I started, well, even before that, having people come to the office at, like in their 50, 60 range saying, oh, you know what, I, I'm done with sex or, mm -hmm. it, you know, it hurts, so forget it, it's okay, whatever. And I was like, why? Like, should there be an expiration date to, to sexuality? Like sex is so good for you in so many ways. So I started doing research in that field and then uh, came up with, uh, wrote the book. And I, I was approached to do this book as part of a series, actually. And uh, it's the Sex Bible for people over 50 and trying to help people have the conversation, but also find solutions. I love that you're talking about it, you know, just like we're talking about perimenopause and menopause, like you were saying, and became it becomes a little bit of that stigma. I, and I was saying to you before we started is that this is the first time I'm having a conversation around sexual health and sexuality and libido here on the you know menopause reimagined. So I have and we did a we did on Facebook, we have this Facebook group and we are Morphous. And my sister-in-law, Kyla, who is very open about sexual health, she's not a therapist, but she just loves to talk about it and you know very open about it. And that's what I love about her. So we had done something about it and it was so popular. Everybody loved it. But, you know, I was like, okay, we need to get somebody who's an expert in this area to really kind of to let's to dig into it and to talk about it. So one of the things, Lori, and I do want to talk more about your book, and I want to talk about the benefits of sex, because I think that's a really important thing to discuss. As we get into perimenopause and menopause, so many of us have this, you know, our, our libidos are tanking. 
And, you know, I see it over and over again. You know, maybe you can explain a little bit as to why we know that it could be a thyroid issue, it could be certain issues that are going on, but perhaps you can give a little bit of background on it and then ways that we can improve it. So I'd like to to take a different approach. Instead of looking at our libidos tanking, how about our libidos changing and not being the same as they were when we were younger? Because even though we may have lower libido, and that could be the result of a multitude of things. I see lower libido in 30-year-olds like I do in the plus 50. Maybe more likely in the older generation because they've been together longer if we're looking at people in long-term relationships. But then I look at single menopausal women who are having lots of sex. So, you know, it, there's a lot of factors that go into desire that it, it isn't just because you're getting older that and even the research shows that we maintain sexual a sexual appetite that it's just not it's not appetite in the same way. That's the difference. So and I actually did a TED talk on this very topic about how desire should be looked at um, for women and what our understanding is of female desire now, which is very different than what it was uh, in terms of, uh, you know, looking at it in more in a linear model like we do for for men, where there's uh, we look at desire first, then arousal you know, and ex excitement and all of that. Whereas for women, what happens often is they lose their spontaneous desire for sex. So they lose that feeling of uh, being horny, let's say, right? But they don't lose their responsive desire. So if you ask these women who have lower desire, how is sex when you do have sex? More often than not, what I hear is it's great. It's wonderful. It feels good. I'm happy. I love it. Whatever. They're just not hungry for it. So what happens is they have to kind of make the choice to have sex and thinking that, okay, well, once it gets going, my desire will kick in. That's the responsive nature of the sexual desire. But women who sit around and wait till they feel like it may wait a long time. Hmm. So you what motivates you to have sex is different today than it might have been in the past. So what might have motivated us is just we're horny and, and you know, we just want to have sex. Whereas today, what motivates us might be I want to feel close to my partner. I love the touch, the intimacy. Um, you know, it, it feels good. And there's all kinds of reasons why we we have sex, obviously. So. Are there ways that you can increase that desire? So for example, masturbation, I know I've heard, you know, you know, that can help to increase that desire. What are some other, or is that a way? And are there other ways that can help to increase that desire? So not, so in order that perhaps it'll give them that um, desire to go and to do it, or to perhaps even initiate it. Well, look, I'm not sure that there's a, there's no Holy grail to increasing desire. I think if it's a problem for you or a problem for your relationship, then there are things you can do. If it's not a problem for you or a problem for your relationship, don't worry about it. You know, it has to be distressing to you to do something about. We have this tendency to think that if I if I'm not hungry anymore, that it's problematic. Mm -hmm. It's only problematic if it's a problem. It may not be a problem. OK, so I, I, I hate the idea of pathologizing a lot of these changes as well, because they don't need to be um, often, right? The other thing too, is that it's not so simple as do this and this will happen because desire is tied into everything else that's going on in your life. So if you are in a marriage or a relationship that is troublesome or boring or um, I don't know, you, you fight a lot, there's tension, there's all kinds of stuff, whatever that dynamic is, that's going to affect whether you have desire or not. Mm -hmm. So even if you masturbate every day, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you're going to want to have sex with your partner. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the problems is women um, are not so in touch with their sexuality. And that's changing the new generation that the, the the younger generations are, they're far more, they're, they're, they're hearing a lot more talk about it. They're more inclined to be open to, to these conversations. Whereas, you know, the 50 plus women, maybe not as much. Um, 
So, you know, getting to know your body, some women start masturbating later in life. That's okay too. You know, there's, it's, there's not an age for this. Like you, you, it, it's good for you to discover what feels good for you because ultimately it's, it's pleasure. So using vibrators, like I have a, 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 a whole chapter in my book on sex toys. You know, sometimes this is the first time women start to use sex toys and there's nothing wrong with that. There's just, there's no taboo around that anymore. Or hardly any taboo, really, when you think about it. What are some good sex toys that women should perhaps, if they want to look into it, that they could they can explore? So I think... Um, what happens to women as they age is that they can lose some of the sensations in their clitoris. Mm -hmm. For 80% of women, they need that clitoral stimulation uh, to orgasm. So th this is why the majority of women do not orgasm through intercourse alone. That's a really important fact. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, it, So whatever is creating that clitoral stimulation. So, so you're going to need a stronger clitoral stimulator. Right. I'm not talking about necessarily a dildo, but something that vibrates. And uh, the, the best one out there, I think, would be the 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 Hitachi magic wand, for example. It's like a back. Basically, it's a back massager and you put a towel on it and you put it on your, you know, your clitoris. And, and it's very, very powerful. So, you know, a partner can't reproduce that. <laughs> that that's the reality. So generally, you're also with an aging partner who might have, you know, uh, may not be able to have the dexterity or the tongue doesn't go as fast or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. you can integrate a sex toy into your lovemaking. And there's nothing wrong with that. It says nothing about your partner's uh, prowess in the bedroom or, or his or her abilities. It just says, this is what I need. I know what I need and let's incorporate this. Hmm. How do you help people get over the shame around it? Well, you have to start talking about it, right? So yeah, listen, you know, the expression life begins outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You stay in that comfort zone, nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. So we have to risk a little, right? You have to, and you do this for yourself. You don't have to do this with a partner. You can explore this on your own. You, Amazon will deliver you uh, a sex toy to your door. You know, nobody needs to know about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't need to go to a store. Although the boutiques today, and I call them boutiques because they are, it's a, it's like a big, you know, shopping mart of sex toys and, and sexual things with uh, staff that are usually extremely educated in what there is there that's you know in our day my day anyway i was like they were seedy you know you just didn't go into those things so not today very 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 different so that's where you start you start by reading you start by learning and educating yourself and you do this for yourself because pleasure is your right right mm -hmm. it's our right i like that pleasure is our right a lot of us in this stage of life have vaginal dryness and it's a yes. really big issue. So what are some tips that you can help women around that if that's preventing them from having sexual, uh, from having intercourse? So that's a very good question because that is one of the major concerns and major consequences of a loss of, of estrogen, of course. So one of the things that's recommended is to not necessarily full on hormone replacement therapies. I know a lot of women, you know, uh, have issues with that and it's okay. If you have no other symptoms, then that may not be for you, but intravaginal hormone replacement therapy is also very good. So something like a uh, Vagifam or something that's prescription, which, um, from my understanding and having spoken to gynecologists, very little of that goes into your bloodstream. It goes directly into the vagina. So to restore some of that moisture is important. Uh, if people don't want to go with that, there are over the counter, uh, moisturizers for the vagina. The one that comes to mind is like Gynotroph, for example, or something like that, that can be put in inside. And even in the, on the labia, if the labia is drying up because sometimes what happens when, why is it painful is that when the skin dries, you, that thin, thin skin, it's like tissue paper. When there's little, little cracks in it, they mm -hmm. hurt like the dickens. So uh, mm -hmm. it can make everything really painful. Uh, so that's something for sure that can be done. Uh, something else that's really helpful for women whose vaginas have maybe atrophied a little bit is to go through pelvic floor physiotherapy. Mm 
um, and they work with you with dilators, et cetera. And that could be a, a, a game changer as well. So it's like, don't lose hope. There's stuff we can do. Also, when you have sex, when you have intercourse, make sure you use a lubricant. And I would recommend a silicone based lubricant that stays really slippery and doesn't dry off like a jelly or something like that. So mm -hmm. that should be a staple on your bedside you know, night table next to your sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Next to your sex toy. <laughs> Let's talk about the health benefits. You mentioned it earlier, and I'd love to hear what you, what you came up with in your research. So many, many, first of all, I didn't find any, not any, uh, you know, uh, negative consequences to sex. So it's, it's all about the benefits, right? So we know that people live longer, uh, if they have regular uh, sex and that could be by themselves too, uh, you know, as long you keep the, you're keeping that, the, the, the energy flowing, you're keeping the blood flowing to the area. So you're keeping it younger by keeping the blood flowing. To me, it's a little bit like if I, if I put my arm in a cast and I don't use it for three months and I take off the cast, that arm is going to be thinner than the other arm. So it's about usage, right? So exercising that and moving it and whatever it is, a, it's a, it's a muscle. It's something that can be worked on, et cetera. So, you know, also sexuality within a couple and sexuality, I, I just must say is not penis and vagina sex. Sexuality is, I look at it as a huge array of activities that couples do. So whether it's lying in bed naked just lying there together, cuddling, kissing, caressing, all of that is part of sexuality. And all of that connects you. So you're, you're thinking about what are the activities that connect us, right, as a, as a couple. Um, so we know like the physical stuff, right? It's, it's, a, it's a good cardiovascular workout. I mean, you're not going to lose weight from it necessarily, but you, you're at least going to keep your heart going, which is, which is very good. We know that um, women, for example, who tend to, who have regular sexual activity tend to look on average seven years younger than women who stop. Uh, so because what's happening also is the, as you're continuing to be sexual, you're actually keeping some of that estrogen going. Mm -hmm. So that keeps the elasticity and, and what have you. So that, that kind of helps like drying up a well, right? So you don't allow it to dry up completely. Um, it helps couples. We know we sleep better. We know that orgasms, for example, help with pain uh, management, um, with sleep, uh, makes us feel better, increases our self-esteem, uh, lowers our blood pressure, uh, increases the, the connection couples feel. They feel closer. Uh, and, you know, the whole I have a whole chapter on all those benefits. But, yeah, there's there's more benefits than there are. Well, there aren't any negative side effects. Actually, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. Of course, all within a healthy relationship. Right. I, I don't want people thinking I have to have sex or, or a partner who says, look, you see, you should be having sex with me. Yeah, but we don't have a good relationship, so I don't want to have sex. With you. you know what I mean? Then right. It's within the context I'm talking about within a context of a healthy relationship. Can you define the difference between love and being in love? Oh, wow. You just touched on some. This is my greatest pet peeve mm. is that line. When I hear somebody say, I love her or I love him, but I'm not in love with him. And I'm like, well, what do you think that actually means? All that says to me is, oh, so you're not in lust with the person. In other words, you don't have all those feelings you had at the beginning. OK, but that's normal. You do not stay in that in lust phase forever. But you love this person. When you love somebody, you work on it. You work on communication. You work on understanding that sometimes our sexuality changes and we need to adapt to it and we need to talk about it. And I need to tell you what your need, what my needs are. And you need to tell me your needs. So when I hear that, I kind of cringe because that's like, how do you compare what you had in the very beginning to what you have now love grows and evolves it doesn't stay in love what does that mean that just means those that passion but that passion not what you felt in the beginning but those you need bursts of that that passion to keep your relationship going and that takes work 
That takes work. And there's research that shows that couples who, who experience life together, in other words, they do things together, new things, they explore new places and new activities, actually are the couples that have the most passionate lives. So passion outside the bedroom brings passion inside the bedroom. And we mustn't forget that. Mm, I love that. Passion outside the bedroom brings passion inside the bedroom. That's great. Well, imagine when you lead a passionate life, you feel passionate about everything in your life, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any foods that can increase our arousal? Uh, I think whatever you think increases your arousal will work. Like, in other words, if eating, uh, you know, strawberries dipped in chocolate in a very romantic sexy way uh, and it it creates some eroticism for you then it works mm. but in terms of actual uh you know nutrition most of it is anecdotal i i can't um i haven't seen any real science to back up like yeah eat lots of bananas and everything will be fine you know and part of the reason is that especially desire is in a woman's brain it is controlled by her brain. And you see this most, this has never been more evident than in the search for the female desire drug. And if you look at the history of, of all these companies looking for that holy grail with very little success. Hmm. Why is that? Because our we control it from our brains and there's nothing to change our brains. What are you going to give us? You know, like how are you, how are you going to fix my bad marriage or how are you going to take the stress away from me? Or how are you going to, you know, so those things don't work. Mindfulness meditation works. So, you know, making sure that you are present in your body, dealing with what's going on in your brain works. Uh, those are the things that really work more than just a food, you know, would that go for supplements as well? I also have not found anything that, and, and don't get me wrong. I've tried different things too. Like I'm saying, ah, oh, let me, let me test this and see. And I have not found anything. I think that unfortunately, and maybe this is cynical, but it, when it comes to sexuality, we're all looking for the, the magic pill. I think it's a little bit like weight loss in, in many ways. And there are a lot of promises out there and there are a lot of things and there are a lot, a lot of anecdotes, but until somebody shows me the peer reviewed science-based stuff, I'm not wasting my money. One thing that I found, and I know you're not a hormone doctor, but one thing that I found that has really helped me is taking, I, I found out, I did some blood work and found out that my DHEA levels were really, really low. Yeah. And I started taking DHEA and I will tell you, I feel a difference. Like it has definitely helped me from that. And I know that's more of like the hormone route. It's a different, it's a different route. Yeah, but, but it's a different way of, de of, of dealing with your hormones, right? So I think there's lots of stuff we don't know yet. So yeah. I'm not gonna, you know, if I found that it, I would have gone the exact same route you did, you know, like if, if something is low, I want to bring it up. Now, I think one one area that we don't have enough research on, which I, I wish we could have more, is on testosterone. Mm. So and testosterone for women, right? So if you, you know, estrogen also produces a certain level of testosterone. We lose our estrogen, we lose our testosterone, which is responsible for the sexual desire. The problem is, is replacing that testosterone. We don't have baseline levels. We don't know how much is too much. If we take it and there are side effects, we start growing hair and we in places we don't want. And, you know, there's a lot of side effects. So there's not not much control over it. And because we don't have enough studies yet. And well, why? I don't know. I don't understand why we don't like we should. This is this might be it. You know, this might be what can help a lot of women. But we you know, even I've spoken to many physicians who have no idea how to prescribe it. Mm -hmm. I just interviewed Dr. Lara Bryden and we touched upon testosterone a little bit. I'll, I'll put a link below. And uh, the nice thing about 
testosterone. Again, this is, it's kind of going a little bit off the topic, but the nice thing about the testosterone with, by taking DHEA, it actually increased my testosterone levels at the same time. So these are, I love that you're, you know, these are conversations that we need to have and that more research needs to be done to see how we can actually help ourselves. So, um, but that's just, you know, that's my opinion. That's something that I've tried. I've done the blood work, the before and after to have the proof that it, it did, you know, it did right. increase my testosterone levels, which is helpful, which is probably why you're saying that it definitely helped with libido as well. Exactly. Exactly. Which I think if people can do a right, especially a menopausal women, go do your, your, your checks, like get all those hormones tested. And some, some physicians don't even know uh, about some of these levels. They're like, Oh, okay. Like they, they, you know, you have to do your, you kind of have to be your own advocate in, in this way because you may know more. Mm-hmm. Some people have, you know, you, you you alluded to this before, they have, you know, as we get into perimenopause and menopause, everything, a lot of things are changing. Perhaps we are we're more irritated a lot of the times and, or we're having issues with our partners. How do you help couples work through those issues? Because a lot, and I've heard this, I've heard this over and over again from women saying like, I, I'm out, I want to be out of my marriage. I'm not happy anymore. You know, I just don't feel like myself. How do you work with people to help bring them back together if that's something that's obviously within their best interest you know again uh i think it depends on what is what is driving them apart or for the woman let's say that you just mentioned what 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 are the symptoms here like this is she's saying i want out of my marriage okay but you don't just want out of your marriage from one day to the next what was your marriage like what is it because you just don't want to tolerate anymore? Is it because you're like, you're, I'm tired of being treated X way. I'm tired of being this. I'm tired of being that. Then what, well, you know, if you're already done, you're done. Like, mm-hmm. and your partner and you've tried to change your partner or you've tried to, to, to get your needs met, your emotional needs met. Maybe you're at an age which coincides menopause with your kids getting older and them leaving the house and them not needing you that you're left with this person that you're like, I don't even know who you are. I don't even like you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes the job isn't to reconnect them unless they both want it. It's to help her get out. (laughs) You know, so I don't know, you know, what is it that is driving them apart? Sometimes, yes, we have to work on, how do we build those connections? You've been focused on the kids for all these years. You've been focused on work. You don't, you, you have lost each other, you know, along the way. So you have to work. How do we, how do we build that couple together? How do we create those, those, um, um, get, you know, getting together, like I said, like those date nights, those events, those things, the, the time spent together, what you're trying to do is build intimacy when you have lost that intimacy. And I'm not talking about sex. Some, sometimes these couples continue to have sex, but don't feel connected necessarily. So how do you start to feel connected with your partner? You do things with them. You share things with them. You uh, like, you can't have intimacy without time. You need time together. Couples who have lost spending time together are not going to find that they have much intimacy. Hmm. So making couple time, I always encourage people to have date nights, regular date nights, regular check-in points every day. Um, We talk about what it is to feel valued, uh, affection, regular daily affection. It's amazing how many couples tell me they can't remember the last time they made out. Hmm. That's what you used to do at the beginning. You know, you talk about lust versus love. Like in the beginning, that's all you do. So that's kind of sad. So to me, it's like starting from the ground up and and little by little increasing that level of connection. Was there anything that we didn't talk about today that you think would be valuable for our listeners? Oh, let's see. We talked a lot about different things. Um, well, I think it's important to, to uh, consider alternatives to intercourse. So uh, instead of, uh, you know, if your vagina doesn't work, penis doesn't work, which is, you know, could be something you can't control or whatever, is to find other ways to be sexual with your partner, not to give up. Like, do not think there's an expiration date to pleasure. That That's the main message for me is that you can have pleasure till the day you die, given that you don't have other physical conditions, obviously, but we have to work with what we have. 
not just say I'm a victim of of life and menopause and and all of this stuff. And so I, I'm just going to give up. No, there's still got a lot of runway left, you know, like make use of it and, um, and find those ways. So, but again, talking about it, I find that a lot of people as they get older are, are, are kind of stretching their boundaries a little more sexually. They're mm-hmm. starting to think of it in a more open way, exploratory way. I know a lot of older couples that are, you know, for the first time are, are opening up their relationship to, you know, other partners, uh, to be with other partners, all within the confines of, of, you know, monogamy, but it's consensual non-monogamy, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So it's not cheating behavior, which is not a solution (laughs) that will destroy. Uh, so yeah, there's, I mean, again, there's, I cover other things in the book as well, but if it, I wrote the book so that couples could read together. That's why I included some pictures because, you know, guys typically don't like to read self-help books. But I figured this one they'll read because there's some nudity in it. Can you say the name of the book again and where people can get it? Yep. It's called The Sex Bible for People Over 50 and it's available on Amazon. It's also available at Indigo Chapters and all the booksellers. And do you work with people one-on-one if they wanted to... You know. Absolutely. Yeah. That's my, the biggest chunk of my work is uh, clinical practice. So a lot of the sessions now are on zoom in the last couple of years. So I do see couples and, and individuals. So marriage counseling, sex therapy, uh, regular psychological counseling. Um, that's, that's the bulk of my work. Amazing. And how can they get in touch with you? Uh, easy. Uh, they can just go to my website, drlaurie.com, D-R-L-A-U-R-I-E.com. They can also follow me on Instagram. I've got a, a podcast there, uh, Passion with Dr. Lori. So uh, you can find that page. And then uh, every week we release a podcast and it talks about some sexual related topic or relationship related topic. Thank you so much for doing this today. My pleasure. I'm so happy that we had that conversation. And like I said, that's the first time I've really talked about sexual health and sexual wellness on Menopause Reimagined. So thank you, Dr. Lori, for having that open discussion with us. If you enjoyed my conversation with Lori as much as I did, please share it because the more you share shows you care. And always remember, we got you, you got this, and we'll see you at the next podcast.